afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's installment of our ongoing lunchtime lecture series. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. We're so grateful that so many of you are taking time out of your busy day, happy Earth Day, by the way, uh, to spend some time with us as we explore this sometimes overlooked but really important chapter in the history of our country and the way we approach the interaction of government and the environment. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker who I'll introduce in just a moment, but before we get to Mr. Bostock, I'm going to just go over a couple of technical housekeeping matters for the ways we like to use this Zoom webinar platform to reach you uh, all over the country and in some cases around the world. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end of this presentation in which you can pose your, your queries to Mr. Bostock. Uh, you, to do so, you're going to use the Q&A section of the webinar. It looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're using to join us today. Now, if during the course of today's presentation you have any technical difficulties, if you feel like you're having trouble hearing us or seeing us, you can go ahead and pose those queries uh, to me in the chat section of the webinar. It looks like one speech bubble. So once again, any questions that you'd like posed to Mr. Bostock can go in the Q&A section. Any troubleshooting can go in the chat section. Now, frequent viewers of our uh, lunchtime lectures know that this is normally where I would hand off to the president and CEO of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell. Uh, she sends her best well wishes to Mr. Bostock and the team. She's out of the country this week. Uh, so you guys are stuck with me for the afternoon. Uh, and so with that, I'm now going to read this fantastic biography. I'm going to share with you why we are so thrilled to have Bob Bostock here with the U.S. Capitol Historical Society this afternoon. Bob is a curator for exhibits at the Nixon Foundation. And in fact, uh, Bob worked for uh, former President Nixon uh, towards the tail end of his time, uh, towards the tail end of his life in the office of former President Nixon. Uh, during his more than three decades of public service, he spent considerable time working on environmental policy, really making him a perfect fit for this sort of program. He worked for uh, Governor Christine Todd Whitman, both when she was governor of New Jersey and when she became EPA administrator uh, during the first administration of President George W. Bush. He also served as director of strategic communications for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and has some fantastic stories about the work that really did wonders to preserve and, and promote uh, wildlife and environmental protection in the state of New Jersey, the Garden State, fitting for uh, Earth Day and, and topics of environmental concern. Uh, he worked for uh, representatives Dean Gallo and Rodney Freelinghausen and Senator Jeff Chiesa during his distinguished career. So he has congressional background as well. So with executive background, with environmental background, with congressional background, we really feel that you couldn't find a better speaker to talk about the environmental decade uh, how President Nixon worked with Congress to advance legislation, including creating the Environmental Protection Agency uh, in order to uh, you know, meet the conservation goals and the environmental protection goals uh, of a renewed interest in our nation. So with all of that said, Bob, thank you so much for being here with us. Tell us about the environmental decade, Richard Nixon and the birth of the EPA. Thank you, Sam. Thanks so much for that very generous introduction. And Thanks to the United States Capitol Historical Society for this program and for giving me the opportunity to speak with the folks on this webinar. I should start by saying happy Earth Day to everyone. This is the 52nd Earth Day, which I find kind of hard to believe because I can remember the first Earth Day. I was in the sixth grade in Radburn Elementary School in Fairlawn, New Jersey. And I remember very distinctly our teacher, uh, doing activities on Earth Day. And then after school was over, a bunch of us, our moms had uh, bought us some flats of flowers that we planted in the park near the school. So that was great fun. I think it would uh, be remiss if I didn't right at the beginning mention Senator Gaylord Nelson from Wisconsin, who of course was the father of Earth Day. Uh, he was a great environmentalist and uh, really kicked, the ball, kicked off the ball to get rolling uh, for that first Earth Day. And since I'm in New Jersey, I should also mention that on Earth Day 1970, New Jersey was the very th only the third state in the country to establish a department strictly dedicated to the environment in that state. So uh, that is something that we also here in New Jersey remember very fondly from that first Earth Day. So I think as we look at uh, the 1970s as a decade of tremendous progress in terms of uh, federal laws and regulations, to protect our environment, to undo the damage that had been done in, in the decades before, 
it's probably helpful for us to kind of set the stage a little bit because in some senses, this whole movement kind of started out of the blue because if you look back at the 1968 campaign when former Vice President Nixon was running against Vice President Humphrey and Governor George Wallace from Alabama, the environment was really not on anybody's radar screen. The Vice President Humphrey, uh, during that campaign, he dedicated a park and a dam. Uh, Mr. Nixon gave one radio address uh, on the environment, which was actually titled Natural Resources. Uh, it was an interesting address, but uh, to paraphrase Lincoln, it would, have, it would have been little noted nor long remembered. And in fact, uh, it took me some research to dig it up. But what's interesting uh, about that address is that uh, it foreshadowed in a way a lot of the things that he wanted to accomplish for the environment during his presidency, including uh, he, the address had 12, the radio address had 12 different points. And uh, it included finding a way to combine the federal government's very different uh, and disparate and spread out activities that concern the environment into one agency and uh, also talked about wildlife preservation, water and uh, land preservation and air cleaning and all, and all of those sorts of things. So it was kind of a foreshadowing of what was going to happen. But again, because that campaign was so focused on, uh, on Vietnam, on crime, on economy, civil rights and other issues, the environment really didn't get very much play. Uh, in fact, in May of 1969, the White House did an internal poll uh, to see what the interest was in protecting the environment, 1% of those polled indicated that that was an important issue to them. And that's in May of 1969. Of course, within less than a year, that would change quite a bit. Uh, there were a couple of events that occurred uh, very early in the Nixon presidency that I think really raised this whole issue to a, um, to a to much greater attention. Uh, the first was in Santa Barbara, California, an oil uh, a pipe burst on January 28th, the eighth day of the Nixon presidency. It was spewing a thousand gallons of oil an hour uh, before they were able to stop the leak. 200,000 gallons of oil had leaked out, dirtied 50 miles of beautiful California coastline. And uh, President Nixon went out to see the site uh, about two months later, didn't want to get in the way of all the cleanup that was going on right away. But it really uh, struck a chord with him. He was a native Californian. He, he loved the California beaches. He grew up in Orange County, spent a lot of time uh, on the beaches. And uh, seeing that, I think, was really quite a, quite a wake-up call, uh, not just for him, but obviously for the entire country. He said at the time that that spill and seeing the damage it created to the natural environment, to the marine uh, mammals and to the birds, uh, really touched the conscience of the American people. And then just uh, not even six months later, of course, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland uh, combusted uh, from an oil slick. Uh, the fire was out within 30 minutes. At the time it, when it happened, it wasn't really covered very deeply, but Time Magazine published a story and put a picture of, a burning, of the burning river on their cover of their magazine. And that really raised uh, people's consciousness about the environment as well. So it, it went from uh, being almost a non-issue on most people's minds, even though the need to clean up the environment was very apparent for a very long time. It was really not on the front of uh, the American public's consciousness in terms of what the federal government's role should be doing. But that all started to change in 1969. Um, Henry Jackson, Senator Henry Jackson from Washington and Congressman John Dingell from the state of Michigan had introduced the National Environmental Policy Act, which is uh, abbreviated as NEPA. I should say when I started at the EPA, a little aside here, uh, those of us who were new to the agency were given a document that was called Frequently Used Acronyms. And uh, the document was three pages, two columns uh, printed on both sides of the paper. And those were the frequently, um, frequently used acronyms. So I'll try and avoid acronyms at the point that I can. But that bill, that uh, piece of legislation was really, really important because it established two things. It established, number one, that going forward when uh, any project was done, the people doing the project had to uh, perform an environmental assessment and do an environmental impact statement. And it also, it also established in the executive office of the president, uh, CEQ, which is the Council on Environmental 
quality, which was designed to uh, serve in much of the way that the President's um, Economic Council did, uh, to serve as an advisory body to the President and the White House staff on environmental issues. Uh, the bill passed by a huge bipartisan vote, which really was the way all throughout the 19, all throughout the 1970s, environmental legislation did pass by huge bipartisan votes. And President Nixon signed it on January 1st, 1970. And then three weeks uh, later, when he gave his first State of the Union address, he laid out a very ambitious plan for environmental protection. Uh, almost 20% of the speech was dedicated to the environment, which is uh, a lot of, <laughs> which is a real big hunk of speech. Uh, I remember when I was at the EPA, uh, we would be asked around State of the Union time to send over, they, I think they put a word limit on it, 100 words that the president might say uh, in the State of the Union speech about the environment. And if we got a sentence in it, we were, we were thrilled uh, to think that almost 20% of the speech was dedicated to the environment, that State of the Union speech was dedicated in the, in, to the environment uh, is really something. And it shows, I think, uh, how the president and the White House staff were really starting to think about how we need to, as he, as he put it, he said, the great question of the 70s is whether we're going to clean up the water and the air and the land that had been so poorly degraded and uh, polluted over the, over the decades before. And then the following month, he sent a very extensive environmental uh, message up to the Congress, which outlined a 37 point program, uh, including 23 major legislative proposals and 14 new uh, actions that could be taken either by administrative actions or executive order. And those, uh, there were five main points in that message to the Congress in 1970, water pollution control, air pollution control, solid waste management, uh, parklands and public recreation, and then organizing for action. And as we see, as the, as the president's term continues, those were, those, were the main, uh, those were the main things that the administration focused on in uh, working with the Congress to get those things done. Um, I should mention also that President Nixon came into office and during his entire presidency, uh, the Congress was in the control of the opposite party. So to get things done uh, required an enormous amount of bipartisan cooperation, uh, particularly at a time when the country was divided on so many other issues. But uh, then in July, the president proposed the creation of the EPA. Um, he wanted to take 44 different agencies that were spread across nine different departments, all of which had uh, environmental responsibilities and bring them into uh, one agency. That internally, particularly in the cabinet, uh, John Whitaker, who served as a, in the Domestic Policy Council in the administration and kind of was the lead staff person for the environment, uh, tells a story about the cabinet meeting where environmental issues came up. And of course, you know, the Secretary of the Interior was proposing certain things to protect the environment. And the Secretary of the Commerce was saying, oh, this will ruin business. And, it, you know, it's that classic argument that has gone on um, really for decades about whether the cost of environmental protection is going to kill jobs um, and, and hurt the economy. Of course, we found over the years that the exact opposite is true. Protecting the environment is not a zero sum game. Um, in fact, it often leads to new technologies, new businesses, new jobs. Both things can be accomplished at the, at the same time. But um, this plan, which was part of the mission of a, of a group that uh, the president appointed soon after he came to office, the Advisory Council on Executive Organization, which was headed by Roy Ash. It's often called the, the Roy Ash or the Ash Commission. Uh, they were the ones who, among looking at all the different aspects of the uh, executive branch, uh, devised this plan to move all of these, all of these uh, different functions into one agency. And uh, by the end of August, or the end of April, rather, in 1970, they had submitted their proposal to the president for his consideration. And then on July 9th, he sent his proposal up to the Congress. Now this was something he did not need uh, congressional approval for. Uh, the way it worked is if, unless Congress within 60 days said you can't do this, then they were able to go ahead and do it. And uh, that's exactly what they did. And on December 2nd of 1970, uh, the EPA uh, was stood up for the first time and Bill Ruckelshaus, 
uh, was appointed as the first administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. And then we saw over the following uh, several years, quite a flurry of legislation, most of which continues to, um, continues to form the foundation of environmental law and regulations here in the United States. Uh, the Clean Air Act in 1970, President Nixon had called for clean air legislation. Uh, Senator Muskie had his version from Maine, had his version of clean air legislation. Uh, there was, there was a, as you read kind of the history of how that all went on, there was a lot of uh, kind of one upsmanship between uh, the White House and, and uh, Senator Muskie's office and others on the Hill, uh, trying to make sure that not only did they have a good bill, but that it was uh, a bill that, you know, always had a little bit more on this side or a little, and then the other side, but add a little bit more on, on their side to uh, kind of play this game of uh, one upsmanship, which is not all that unusual on Capitol Hill. But what seems unusual now, but was not unusual then during, during the 70s, was that uh, both Senator Muskie, Democrat from Maine, and uh, President Nixon, Republican obviously, uh, were able to work it out and uh, get something that they could both agree on. Uh, neither one got 100% of what they wanted, but they each got enough that they could agree on it and move it forward. Um, when, they, uh, when it went to conference, uh, the House bill was a little less stringent than the Senate bill. Uh, the Senate pretty much prevailed. The bill passed again by a huge bipartisan majority. It's, it's almost unfathomable. I, I don't think you get majorities that big on naming post offices. Uh, and then went to, went to President Nixon's desk and he signed it on December uh, 31st in 1970. So the year started off with um, NEPA, uh, signing on January 1st, 1970, the National Environmental Policy Act, and then it concluded with the signing of the Clean Air Act, which has made such a difference over the years uh, to the quality of air in the United States. Then again, in 1972, uh, the president sent up another environmental message, and it included, uh, again, a, a number of initiatives that he wanted to see addressed and that many members in the Congress were also uh, working on as well. Uh, it included such issues as regulating toxic substances that hadn't really been done, a comprehensive improvement in pesticide authority. Uh, again, that was another classic uh, battle in the cabinet. Uh, you know, the Interior Department wanted more, con more concerns on that. The uh, Secretary of Agriculture was like, oh, you're going to kill American agriculture. We need those pesticides to be able to raise crops to feed the country. Uh, he also included noise control, uh, the preservation of historic buildings. Uh, the siting of power plants to make sure those were done in an environmentally responsible way. Um, ocean dumping regulations were something else you saw. It. And in, the, in water, um, wanted to greatly expand water treatment grant programs so that you could improve the, uh, or give, give communities who had water treatment plants or many who didn't, who were just dumping raw sewage into uh, rivers and, and, uh, and in some cases the ocean. Uh, the money to build a water treatment plant to reduce those uh, dumping of, of that stuff right into the ocean. Uh, so that was kind of, he set out his environmental um, agenda, if you will, for 1972. And again, we saw a lot of action uh, in the Congress and uh, with President Nixon. Uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, was, was passed in 1972. It was introduced by uh, Representative uh, Edward Garmatz from Maryland. Uh, again, a hugely important bill uh, and law to protect marine mammals. It prohibited um, going far once it was passed. It made it illegal to harass, feed, hunt, capture, or kill any marine mammal. Uh, hugely important for the recovery, particularly of marine mammals uh, along the coastlines. Uh, that bill, you know, I've been talking about huge bipartisan majorities. That passed the House in March of 1972 by 362 to 10. And it passed the Senate in late July of that year in an 88 to two vote, extraordinary. And then President Nixon signed the bill in October of 1972. Uh, the Clean Water Act also was uh, passed in 1972. Uh, that was introduced by Senator Muskie. The White House supported it, except for some of the money that was being put in there for some uh, water grants. That passed the Senate 86 to nothing. It passed the House by a voice vote. Uh, the conference committee, uh, when that was passed in October, 
uh, 30, 366 to 11 in the House, 74 to nothing in the Senate. Uh, the president vetoed the bill because he was concerned about the expenditures in there in terms of their budgetary impact. But he knew, and everybody in the White House knew, when a bill passes by that margin, that it's going to the veto will be overridden. And in fact, uh, the day that he vetoed it, the Senate overrode the veto at a 52 to 12 vote. And the next day, the House overrode the veto in a vote of uh, 247 to 23. And among the people um, voting to override uh, President Nixon's veto was Representative Gerald Ford, who, of course, within a year would become, or a little over a year, would become Nixon's vice president. Uh, 1992, also, the EPA banned the use of uh, DDT, the pesticide DDT, which was having such a terrible effect on um, the environment. It, it's one of those chemicals that is persistent. It doesn't really go away. Um, it gets into the food chain. Um, it makes it very difficult to hurt a lot of birds because when they would ingest fish or whatever, the DDT would get into their systems. Had a terrible impact on uh, bird eggs, made the shells very, uh, very fragile. And uh, we were seeing a reduction in birds such as the American eagle uh, because of the DDT. So in 1970, 1972, rather, uh, Administrator Ruckel's House announced that DDT was going to be banned, and indeed it was banned, and that had a huge impact on the environment. Uh, the following year, 1973, we saw the passage of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, that bill was introduced by Senator Harrison Williams from New Jersey on uh, June 12th of 1973. It passed the Senate uh, less than two months later, 92 to nothing. It passed the House uh, two months later, 390 to 12. Um, the president signed it uh, once the conference report was done at the end, near the end of December. He signed it on December 28th, 1973. This has been such a highly successful uh, bill over the years. Uh, 96, uh, 96 of the protected species that have been listed over the years have been delisted because they have come back far enough that they are no longer considered endangered. Among them are the American alligator, the brown pelican, the peregrine falcon, and of course the American bald eagle. And I think the story of the American bald eagle's comeback is extraordinary. Um, here in New Jersey, when I was at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, I hosted a podcast where, where I spoke with different people from around the agency to talk about what they did and what their mission was in the agency. One of the people I spoke with uh, had headed up all the way back in 1970 the program in New Jersey to try and restore bald eagles to New Jersey. In 1970, there was one nesting pair of bald eagles in the entire state of New Jersey. And um, it was, we were in danger of losing them because of the fragility of the eggs that they laid. So the New Jersey uh, DEP devised this program where they found somebody who was really good at climbing trees. They located the, the we knew where the one nesting pair was. This fellow climbed up 150 feet up to an eagle's nest that they had seen, had, the eagle had laid two eggs, carrying two wooden eggs of the exact same size, color, weight as the eagle's legs. Uh, he took the wooden eggs, put them in the nest, obviously when the eagle was not there, um, took out the two real eggs, carried them back down this tree 150 feet. And they found, as the person described it to me, a very light chicken who could incubate the eggs. And in fact, the eggs uh, successfully hatched. Uh, the same uh, fellow who had climbed 150 feet up this tree, went back to the tree with the two eaglets, climbed the tree, took the wooden eggs out of the nest, put the two eaglets in, and uh, the, the birds, the bald eagles, raised those two eaglets, eaglets to maturity. And that was the beginning of the comeback of bald eagles in New Jersey one nesting pair in New Jersey in 1970. Now in the state of New Jersey, there's more than 150 nesting pairs throughout the state, which is such an extraordinary comeback. And there are stories like that all around the country, which I think reflects uh, not only the federal government's important role in making sure that uh, these species are protected, but also the efforts of uh, state and local governments and the county governments and tribes uh, to do their part to help uh, restore the environment from all the damage that had occurred uh, previously. Another program that uh, President Nixon initiated was called the Legacy of Parks. 
uh, he looked over. He, he was he was really big on trying to, you know, cut government bureaucracy. In fact, he he observed that when he announced the start of the EPA, it kind of went counter to his normal philosophy. You know, creating a new department was not something I think he would have expected to do. But uh, he asked all of the the uh, federal departments and agencies to look at the land that they owned to see if there was land that was no longer being used that could be turned over to state, county, local, tribal governments uh, to be converted into parks. And that program was so successful that over the course of its uh, life, uh, over the course during the Nixon administration, 80,000 acres of federal land were, was turned over to uh, state, local, county, tribal governments to create parks. 642 new parks were created around the country uh, that now gave people uh, particularly in areas where there were not necessarily a lot of parks for either recreation or uh, either active or passive recreation, gave them an opportunity to uh, go out and enjoy the beautiful uh, country that we have in an, in an environment that was uh, safe and, uh, and accessible to them, uh, a highly successful program. As we go on, um, 1974, and, and by this time, Mr. Nixon has left office, the Safe, Water, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act in 1974, again, passed with huge overwhelming majorities. President Ford signed that into law in 1974. Uh, the Toxic Substances Control Act in 1976, again, huge bipartisan majorities signed by President Ford. Uh, the RICRA, as, the, uh, as it's called, uh, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, also huge bipartisan majorities. Ford signed that in 1976 as well. And then of course, uh, President Carter, one of the most significant pieces of environmental legislation passed during that whole period of the 70s was the Superfund law, uh, which, which was introduced by New Jersey representative Jim Florio, who went on to become governor of New Jersey some years later. Uh, again, that passed the House and the Senate by huge majorities. Uh, President Carter signed it in December of 1980. That law has had such a great impact on cleaning up polluted sites where the responsible parties uh, had abandoned the sites and could not be found. Uh, federal money has gone into cleaning these sites. New Jersey has the uh, unhappy distinction of being the state with the most Superfund sites in the country as a result of our industrial legacy. But enormous progress has been made in cleaning up those sites and in many cases being able to put them into beneficial use. So as we look back at the 70s and all of the uh, legislation and the laws and the regulation that were passed by, by the Congress and the White House working together, uh, both President Nixon and President Ford were working with uh, majorities in both houses of the opposite party, President Carter, uh, his, he was working with the Congress of the same party. But in, any, but in every case, there was just enormous bipartisan support for environmental action, which I think reflects a couple of things, um, several things. The first was the demand by the public for action, which was really kicked off by Earth Day. 20 million people around the country participated in Earth Day activities. That's like one out of every 10 Americans. Population of the United States at the time was about 200 million. One out of 10 people participated in an Earth Day activity. Uh, another thing is, I think it's important to note that both the president and the Congress, they were seeking solutions to the problem and not just seeking issues that they could use to run on uh, for any length of time and, and kind of beat each other up. You know, this one's not doing enough, that one's not doing enough. They wanted solutions. They weren't looking to perpetuate issues. And I think that was hugely important to the success of the 70s, um, particularly at a time when the country was divided over so many other things, just because uh, one party disagreed with the president on import an important issue like say Vietnam, didn't mean they were gonna vote against every single thing that that president wanted to do. In fact, they work together in a very, very strong way. Um, and that I think is, is, is so important. These bills, when they were sent to the president, both sides, both the Republicans and the Democrats were willing to reach across the aisle, work together and find a solution that both sides could accept and, um, and vote for. Um, too often, that is not always the case, <laughs> uh, but it was certainly the case on environmental issues during the entire period of the 1970s. And I think uh, also the fact that 
you know, compromise was not a dirty word. And that's part of what goes across being able to work across the aisle. You're not going to get 100% of what you want. Maybe you'll get 80 or 75, but you'll get some of what you want. And it's better to have some of what you want than have nothing. And, you know, during that entire period on environmental issues, compromise was not a dirty word. And I think also the last thing, and, and, and this may have something to do with why uh, the decades subsequent to the 1970s have not been as productive in terms of uh, finding solutions to some of our environmental problems. You know, I have to say that many of these early laws were, were going after some of the low hanging fruit that needed to be addressed. Uh, you know, smokestacks spewing stuff into the air, you could control that. Uh, factories dumping raw sewage and raw industrial uh, waste into, into lakes, and, or not lakes, but into rivers and into the ocean. You could stop that. A lot of the, uh, the car, the pollution generated by automobiles, huge, which led to uh, emission standards being put in place and getting rid of lead and gasoline. Uh, ocean dumping, that is something that you can end without too much trouble. A lot of the environmental problems we face today, uh, the solutions are not as, as, as easy and straightforward as that. And that is probably also a factor that has to do with the fact that um, we're not seeing as, we haven't seen as productive an era as the 1970s in environmental protection. And I just want to end before I take your questions on talking a little bit about uh, Richard Nixon and the environment. Um, if you read a lot about what happened during the Nixon administration, uh, many authors uh, seem to uh, find it kind of extraordinary that Nixon did this and, and, and they say, oh, he just did it for politics or, you know, he only did it because people wanted it. Well, I kind of hope that our leaders do things because people wanted it. But Nixon did have a record on the environment that went all the way back to 1962 when he ran for governor of California. Uh, during that campaign, he, he proposed, unsuccessful campaign, he proposed uh, measures to reduce air pollution, uh, to reduce vehicle emissions, and to safeguard water quality by protecting watersheds. A lot of these ideas were ahead of their time, uh, eight, 10 years ahead of their time. So it wasn't something new. And then, um, also, you know, the, you heard people say, oh, his heart wasn't really in it. He didn't really care about it that much. You know, my answer to that is, I, I think we ought to be judging our presidents and our congresses kind of on what they do. You know, maybe it, he was very focused on ending the war in Vietnam, on other issues that were at the top of his plate. Uh, did he spend as much time uh, focusing about environmental issues as he did on things like Vietnam, opening to China, the detente with the Soviet Union, desegregating Southern schools, all of those other things that were accomplished during his administration. Uh, but nevertheless, he had a staff that was very passionate about these things, starting with, um, and this surprises people, John Ehrlichman, who was his domestic policy advisor. He had been a land use attorney in Seattle, uh, knew a lot of, and had that kind of Pacific Northwest uh, ethos about the environment. Uh, John Whitaker, who was uh, the lead staffer on the White House domestic policy staff on the environment, an ardent uh, environmentalist, Russell Train, who uh, Nixon appointed to head up CEQ, uh, and then who later went on to serve as the head of the EPA. Again, an ardent uh, uh, environmentalist. And of course, Bill Ruckelshaus, who went into the EPA and, and took the mission very seriously. In fact, when he announced the um, banning of DDT in 1972, he hadn't really cleared it with the White House. And when the White House learned, they were like, oh, you know, Bill's kind of gone off the reservation, but they made no effort to, to roll that back because Ruckelhaus was doing what needed to be done at that time, and he had the authority to do it. So I think that uh, as one tries to evaluate President Nixon's environmental record, uh, I like to look at a, a survey that was done among 12 of the major environmental groups here in the country uh, 10 years ago. And President Nixon was named the second greenest president, and he was second only to uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the great conservationist president. And President Nixon admired uh, Teddy Roosevelt so much that I don't think he would have minded too much uh, the fact that he came in second to uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And interestingly, number third on the list was Jimmy Carter. Uh, so those two presidents, the number two and number three on that list, were both part of that incredibly productive period of environmental protection during uh, the, dec the decade of the 70s. So I, I think as we look back at that time now and look back on Earth Day now, more than half a century ago, uh, I think we can all owe a debt of thanks to uh, the Congress, to the members of Congress who worked together in such a collegial bipartisan way to get this legislation passed, 
as well as to President Nixon, whose leadership and whose uh, enacting of all these bills, signing of all these bills, has made a huge difference in the quality of, envir of our environment over the past 50 years. And I hope that as people look at that decade, they see it as, uh, as an example of how on, on issues that, you know, maybe you don't agree on everything, you can still get something done. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to uh, take any questions, but I think Sam, first we wanted to go sure, through yeah. a couple of photos. Yeah, so I was going to say, you know, um, uh, and thank you for that fantastic presentation, Bob. This has really been, you know, fascinating, and I, and I have questions. And I'm sure our members of our audience have questions too that they're excited to pose. But I wanted to take a minute uh, while we're all still here. Uh, you know, we mentioned at the top that you're a curator for exhibits at the Nixon Foundation, uh, and I know uh, that uh, you and I have discussed you uh, curated an exhibit uh, on. President Nixon and the environmental decade. And so we thought it would be uh, uh, interesting for everyone here on, on today's webinar if we took a quick spin through some fun photos, some, some fun images from that exhibit you curated. If you can give us a little extra, uh, a little extra context or, or share what you might, you know, how, how you would talk about this as a museum curator, as a public sure. historian. Let, let me say about the exhibit uh, before we start talking about the pictures. It is the first a policy oriented outdoor exhibit in the entire presidential library system. The entire, of course, we have the benefit of being, the Nixon Library has the benefit of being located in Orange County, California, where of course we know it never rains in Southern California. <laughs> uh, so you can have an outdoor exhibit that people can see 12 months of the year. But it's a great exhibit because it has, you know, there are uh, sculptures of some of the uh, creatures that have been, or the species that have been brought back from extinction. It has this wonderful uh, brass, uh, in high relief of many of the marine mammals that have been uh, preserved because of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. We have in, in, in concrete um, footprints of different animals that have been affected by President Nixon's uh, activities that children, particularly when they school groups, when they go, they're given a list, you know, find these, find these uh, footprints, you know, and identify them. So it's a wonderful interactive uh, visit outdoors and on the beautiful grounds of the Nixon Library. Uh, and as I say, it's the only uh, completely outdoor policy oriented uh, exhibit in the entire uh, entire National Archives presidential library system. I will say the day we were supposed to open it, um, there were wildfires about 30 miles away from Yorba Linda. The sky was brown and it was raining ash. Um, <laughs> and the air quality was really bad. So we, we canceled the opening. Uh, not only because of the air quality, but also because I think it would have been uh, kind of uh, horribly ironic to be talking about everything President Nixon did on behalf of the environment under brown skies with ash raining down from the sky. So that kind of worked out all right. But it's a great exhibit. Anybody who's in uh, ever in Southern California and Orange County, be sure to go see it. It's a lot of fun. But l let's start with this picture. Of yeah. President Nixon, of course, is the only president, still the only president who was a native of California. Uh, kind of hard to believe given how big California is. But uh, here he and Mrs. Nixon are, are planting a sequoia tree on the south grounds of the White House. Uh, he, he, uh, he, li he actually liked doing tree plantings. He and Mrs. Nixon liked doing tree plantings. And uh, as Californians, they wanted to put this sequoia in there. Um, I don't believe it had, it thrived. I'm not sure Washington was uh, exactly the place for this tree to thrive, but it did grow for a number of years. And then uh, as far as I know, it's not still present on the White House grounds, but uh, it's certainly, you know, presidents have been planting trees on the White House grounds forever. Um, many of them are still there going all the way back to Andrew Jackson's magnolias that flanked the South Portico, uh, just as a kind of way to promote the, the place where they come from and, and to promote the, uh, the beauty of the, of the grounds of the White House. So there he is planting a tree. <laughs> Wonderful. So I've got to click on the thing and now, so yeah, so here, um, here we go. Uh, another uh, tree related yes. photo here. Yes. Now, this is the president and Mrs. Nixon at their home in San Clemente, California, which during his presidency was known as, as the Western White House. And this is on the grounds of uh, their home. I have had I've had the great pleasure of actually going to that home uh, when the Nixon sold that a very good friend of theirs uh, bought the home and still owns it. And um, occasionally we'll open it up for events, but also 32 years ago when I was working on the original Nixon Library and, and was out there for some uh, visits, the owner, um, Gavin Herbert and his wife, Danetta, uh, invited me to come see it. And it's just a spectacular place on a high bluff overlooking the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, so this is, this, these pictures were taken, I think in February. 
Uh, so the weather was a little bit inclement, but uh, they got a lot of uh, fun pictures there. Looking, they're looking out towards the ocean uh, on a bench on the grounds of their home in San Clemente, which is just such a beautiful spot. I said when when I went there, my wife and I went there way back in 1990. I said, man, if I lived here, I would never leave. It, would ju it was just spectacular. It's gorgeous. Absolutely. And it's, it's easy to see how someone with that kind of, you know, beautiful vista can fall in love with or really, you know, take environmental issues to heart. Absolutely. And he actually opened the, um, the beach down there. It's a great surfing beach, which uh, had been closed, you know, because of security concerns, closed whether he was there or not. Uh, he had them open it so that surfers could enjoy it. Um, when he wasn't there. Secret Service did not want it open when he was in residence there, but when he was not, it was open for surfing. It's a great spot. Nice. A surfing legacy as well. Yes. <laughs> so speaking of uh, aquatic activities. Yeah, this is uh, President Nixon and his uh, daughter, Julie Nixon Eisenhower, uh, on a boat. They're kind of on vacation. Uh, I, as I recall, this is taken up in Maine. Um, the Nixons love the water. Um, they had a house down in Florida. Uh, on the water in Key Biscayne. Uh, when he retired to New Jersey after he left California, uh, he would frequently drive down uh, to the Jersey shore to go for a swim. Um, you know, it, it, fascinating. He, he gave up his Secret Service protection in the early 1980s and just had like one uh, former Secret Service agent who was his driver. So he basically had very little, if any, security. And uh, despite how controversial he was, he never had an unpleasant um, uh, encounter with anybody and all the time he spent out, you know, whether it's swimming in the beach or whatever. But this is a great, this is the, the Nixons really loved, uh, loved being on the water. Uh, he used the presidential uh, yacht, which he named Sequoia, again, after the, the magnificent trees in uh, California, more than any uh, other president uh, during the whole time that, the, that they had presidential yachts, because they really liked being on the water. Absolutely. Do you think? For them. Yeah. I was going to say, do you think his passion for, you know, his, his enjoyment of being out on the water, do you think that might have shaped, as someone who knew him, do you think that might have shaped his interest in some of the sort of water specific or the marine mammal, perhaps, uh, you know, policy that uh, the big accomplishments in that field? Oh, I think it absolutely did. Um, he, uh, you know, as I said, he grew up in Southern California um, and he and Mrs. Nixon, particularly when they were dating and then when they were first married, would uh, they lived in Whittier in Orange County, which is you know not on the beach, uh, but would often uh, with friends go down to the beach with picnics and just spend the day on the beach. And this would have been in the you know the early 1940s, and of course as a boy in the, the 30s and the 20s. Um, so he yeah he he loved the beach. <laughs> he loved he loved the ocean. He really did. And I think there's no doubt that his appreciation for that. Uh, definitely drove a lot of his um, concern about the environment and about, and about water quality. Absolutely. You talked about the tree plantings. Here we have yes. another one. Here's another tree planting uh, with a young man. Um, both of them dressed up very nicely, I must say. I, yeah. um, I don't recall exactly where this is, but again, um, presidents do lots of tree plantings. And uh, it's always a great opportunity, I think, for any president to... Uh, to show in a very tangible way, in a way, and also in a way that will be remembered uh, that they planted a tree. Um, when I worked for Governor Whitman, uh, when she was governor here in New Jersey, um, one of the Earth Days, I'm not sure how we arranged this, but she actually came to the uh, elementary school that my son was in, in kindergarten. What a marvelous uh, coincidence of scheduling. Uh, but she came and planted uh, New Jersey's uh, state tree, the red oak, uh, in front of his school and it's still there you know it was just a little not maybe six feet tall at the time and now it's a big spreading beautiful oak uh, so tree planting is is great uh, for presidents and, and governors and others to not only show their concern for the environment but uh, something that you know they say you know planting a tree shows faith in the future uh, and also just a way to commemorate a particular event absolutely how wonderful mm -hmm. so jumping back to the Nixons in the beach uh, and perhaps some interesting uh, sartorial choices, but, uh, yes. but well, enjoying well, the beach nonetheless. <laughs> yes, well, well, folks will notice if they've been, if they're looking very closely, this photo was taken at the same time as the photo of them sitting on the bench on kind of a gray overcast uh, day. Now, I wanna point out that getting from his house down to the beach, 
like 150 feet along a pebbled path, which you would not want to walk down in your bare feet. It would be most uncomfortable. And there was nothing down there for him to change out of his shoes, you know. So I know he gets a lot of ribbing, you know, oh, Nixon would, he's the only guy who would walk on a beach, you know, in his shoes. But it was the weather, it was the, it was the, uh, the walk down this kind of pebbled uh, path down to the beach from the home, which is why he and Mrs. Nixon have their shoes on. Now people say he has wingtips on, he does not have wingtips on, they're casual shoes. Mrs. Nixon has sneakers on. I've seen plenty of pictures of them at the beach where he's not wearing shoes, you know. He, <laughs> but for some reason, you know, for some reason, this one, I guess, sticks in people's mind. They like to say, oh, he, you know, he'd like to wear shoes on the beach. In fact, he didn't. But given, given the weather and given the long walk down this pebbled path, you know, I, I would have worn shoes to get down there as well. Absolutely. And if it makes it if it makes it any better, I, I do have distinct memories of a photo of Truman on the beach wearing wingtips. So uh, and I've seen and JFK on the beach wearing loafers. So <laughs> there we go. So it, there's there's a grand tradition. There's a grand yes. tradition for sure. Um, speaking of, of grand traditions and speaking of, you know, legacies of multiple presidents here, we have this great image. Could you tell us a little bit about what's going on here? Yeah, this is great because it speaks, I think, to the bipartisan nature of environmental uh, policy making and uh, interest in in the 1970s. This is uh, the president dedicating a grove in uh, of sequoias in Northern California to Lady Bird Johnson. So you can see in this picture uh, on either side of the plaque that is there, you have President and Mrs. Johnson, and then on the other side, President and Mrs. Nixon. And uh, this was to recognize the incredible work that Mrs. Johnson did while she was in the White House for beautification of America. Uh, she was so, she was so, Mrs. Johnson was so instrumental in um, not only planting flowers all over Washington, D.C. and other places, uh, but also leading efforts to uh, get billboards off of highways, you know, and, and removing other uh, unsightly things along the, the nation's roads and uh, in their parks. And, and that was a, a great passion of hers. Um, there are so many photographs I've seen of her, uh, particularly in Texas, it's blue bonnet season now, I guess in Texas, pictures of her with the blue bonnets and you know, just, just kind of loving flowers and really wanting to beautify uh, nature. And uh, President Nixon wanted to recognize Mrs. Johnson for that. Uh, the, the Nixons and the Johnsons went way back um, they were both in Washington. Uh, LBJ got there a little earlier than Mr. Nixon did when he was first elected to the House in 1946. But uh, you know, when Nixon was Senate uh, was Vice President of the United States and, and therefore Senate President, uh, you know, presiding officer of the Senate, LBJ was the majority leader. And uh, you know, they would work together on legislation. In fact, one of the one of the seminal pieces, of the first, in fact, the first civil rights legislation passed since Reconstruction. Uh, was passed during the Eisenhower administration. And, uh, you know, Nixon worked very closely with Johnson in rustling up the votes for that. Um, just, this is off the environmental subject, but Martin Luther King, uh, then who Nixon had met in, in Ghana when Ghana became independent, uh, sent Nixon a letter afterwards saying, you know, it, it couldn't have been done without your effort. But uh, again, that's just another example of how, you know, uh, both sides of the aisle can work together to get things done. And this, I think, is such a great example of one president honoring the work of, of one of his predecessors, different party, uh, often on different sides of the issues, but uh, recognizing in what I think is a great uh, tradition, which we could, well, I won't say we could use more of, but maybe I should say that. But uh, <laughs> showing that uh, in the end, you know, the people who go to Washington and, and serve in government at every level, um, you know, their main purpose is, is to do right by the people who send them there. And uh, I think this is a, a great example of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think oh yeah, here's one more uh, before we move into audience questions, just yes. speaking about legacies. Yeah, I mentioned the Legacy of Parks uh, program. Uh, this is a site in New York. And there you see uh, President Nixon's daughter, Julie Nixon Eisenhower, and uh, Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York, dedicating a 2100 acre public park that uh, had been previously uh, owned by the federal government, turned over to the state of uh, New York. 
as a great park for uh, people to use. And it's one of you know those 2,100 acres are part of the 80,000 acres that were um, turned out from turned from the federal government to state, county, local, and tribal governments uh, during the Nixon administration. And that's just one of the several hundred parks that were, several hundred parks that were created as a result of that program. A remarkable legacy. So as we pull out of the image sharing here, we're going to start bringing some questions uh, uh, from the audience and we'll lead with one, um, an, an interesting approach to thinking about uh, the frequent, um, you know, collaborator of sorts, uh, uh, certainly a, a, you know, a, a, a parallel track, if you will, uh, uh, Senator Muskie. Uh, one of our audience members asks, uh, to what extent did uh, President Nixon uh, see Senator Muskie as, uh, as a leading contender uh, in the 1972 election in the Democratic field? Uh, and do you think that might have had any, uh, in, you know, do you think that consideration might have played into how he approached uh, working with Senator Muskie? Uh, there's no doubt that uh, President Nixon and, and pretty much everybody saw Senator Muskie as a leading contender for the Democratic nomination in 1972. As uh, folks will recall, the election in 1968 was razor thin, uh, not so much in the popular vote, but def or rather not so much in the electoral vote, but definitely in the popular vote. Very, very close. And uh, Muskie had, uh, although he was from a state with not a heck of a lot of electoral votes, uh, comported himself uh, very well uh, during that campaign and I think uh, became known on the national scene in a way that he had not uh, become known on the national scene uh, prior to his uh, being selected by Vice President Humphrey as his uh, running mate in 1968. So I suspect uh, that, you know, I mean, politics is it's not foreign to uh, Washington, D.C. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, probably part of the calculation and only part of it uh, was, you know, we don't want folks to get ahead of us on issues that people are increasingly uh, concerned about. But to both Nixon and Muskie's credit, I think, uh, they were able to come together. You know, Muskie could have, uh, with the Democrats in control of the Congress, said, you know, we're, not, we're, we're gonna move stuff that Nixon's gonna veto, and that'll give us an issue in 1972. And, uh, you know, and. And rather than kind of play politics to that level, you know, to Senator Muskie's credit, he said, let's get something done. It's more important than we get something done that, that, that I have than I have an issue to run on in 1972. So I think the uh, cooperation you saw between the White House and uh, the Congress, uh, particularly on the issues that Senator Muskie uh, was advancing, is uh, kind of how politics should work. <laughs> sure. You, know, you find the common ground, you get something done, everybody benefits. Absolutely. It does. I do want to ask, though, we talked about the, you know, the veto. Uh, and I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I, you know, that when you shared about the Clean Water Act and, and mm. the veto and the override um, and, you know, the wide margins, including uh, future uh, vice president, future president Ford. Um, you know, I, I would imagine I, I've never uh, been personally acquainted with any presidents of the United States, but I would imagine that uh, a veto override sticks with you a little bit. It has, you know, as, as you, you it, it's, it's a, it can be a strong action. Do you know uh, if that uh, particular episode, the Clean Water Act and the override, uh, did that stick with uh, President Nixon, do you know, uh, having spent time with him? You know, he, he um, you know, he served in the House, he served in the Senate, he was the Vice President, so he had a lot of eight years of knowing how Capitol Hill works. He was, he was on the Hill from 47 to 61, right, continuously, House, Senate, Vice President. Um, you know, on that one, it, it could have been no surprise to him that it was going to be vetoed because it had passed by such huge margins. Uh, he was really concerned from a budgetary standpoint about the money that was in there for uh, sewage treatment grants. And in fact, although the bill passed, he then impounded some of the money. Congress responded by uh, removing a president's ability to impound <laughs> appropriated funds. And he was not the first president to impound. Interestingly, sure. when, uh, when Ford became uh, president, when President Ford took office, uh, again, another water bill was passed with huge sewage grants which Ford opposed. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, again, it's one of those things where, you know, the world looks different from the White House than it does from the Hill. And a president who's concerned about uh, budget concerns, you know, because money, you're spending it here, you can't necessarily spending it there. His priorities may differ, but, you know, I don't think that one stuck with him too badly. He knew it was gonna be overridden. 
And, uh, you know, he supported probably 99% of the bill, except for that one line item. So I know that didn't, there were others, I think, that struck in his, stuck in his craw more, uh, more than that. Sure. One. Certainly, certainly. Well, you know, we've got this really fantastic audience, real history lovers here. Uh, and one of our audience members has asked um, if there's a way that they, as members of the public, can get access to that uh, early speech you mentioned that you had to root around and, and, and dig for, uh, laying out some of uh, President Nixon's environmental interests. Is that something they can go to the to the library or, or to the it's archive? It's in the library, but it's also, it's also online. Um, now I'm having a, uh, I can't remember the name of the university, but if you, if you Google Nixon 1968 radio address, natural resources, it'll come right up because I, I have it in a book, all his radio speeches from the campaign. But uh, before I went to dig out my book, I looked online and, oh, it was right there. I didn't even have to go to the book. <laughs> so yes, it's readily available online. Um, and in fact, all of the uh, public papers of the president's uh, Certainly, the modern ones um, up until recently. I don't think I don't think the most recent ones have gotten online, but it's a great resource uh, to be able to look at the uh, volumes of the public papers of the president. And these happen to be on there as well because he gave those speeches during the campaign. So yeah, just just Google you know Nixon radio address natural resources 1968. It'll pop right up. Marvelous, marvelous. Well, I think to bring it home with sort of one concluding question, you know, the, the environmental decade, there was this explosion that you've so eloquently and, and thoroughly laid out for us, these incredible pieces of, you know, truly world changing legislation, you know, in a positive way, you know, by the time we get into the 80s and 90s, that seems to have uh, dropped off. There wasn't the same pace of environmental legislation. Uh, and, you know, we're in a point, we're in, we're in a moment now where it seems like there's a growing return to this public interest and demand for public action. Uh, you know, I, I certainly, as a, as a native Washingtonian, uh, you know, we seem to see it more and more, this, this demand, this public demand, you know, do you think we're starting to see uh, uh, the beginnings of perhaps a new environmental decade or at least something approaching another environmental decade? Well, I hope so. I, you know, I think what it's going to take is um, even more a kind of grassroots demand for these sorts of things. Um, there's no doubt that that first Earth Day with 20 million participants, you know, really gave a, a, a big jump start uh, to the to things that were already percolating right on the Hill and in the White House, but gave a big jump start to that. But you know, there's still, if you, if you look at polls where people name their most important issue, the environment doesn't poll nearly as high as one would expect, um, you know, because there are other issues, particularly pocketbook issues and issues of war and peace that will tend to, um, tend to poll higher. But, you know, those pocketbook issues were there throughout the, the 1970s, <laughs> you know, Vietnam, uh, it was incredibly divisive. Um, inflation after 1973, you know, became a huge problem with the oil crisis and that just kind of moved things along. Um, so I think what it's going to take is not only more grassroots demand for these things, but also kind of a change in the way um, the folks in DC approach them. Um, one of the things that I think has been unfortunate due to what I see is basically gridlock over environmental issues for at least almost 30 years is that the states are now stepping into and, and doing what the federal government's not doing. Um, it's not the most efficient way to address environmental challenges uh, because you, know, you can have a law in one state that is different in the next state and that's different from another state. It, and that's where it really makes it difficult, I think, for particularly companies and, uh, that have uh, locations in more than one state to kind of figure out what they're supposed to do. Um, and it, it, it kind of detracts from the kind of progress you could make if you had national standards and and, uh, and national laws. So, you know, I hope that uh, I hope that as as we look at the environmental challenges that still exist, non-point source pollution, which is you know basically runoff, uh, which is really hard to control. Um, interestingly, in that radio speech, or maybe it was in one of the other documents, Nixon talks about the the, the water problem caused by agriculture, uh, not just the fertilizers. Uh, which have some measure of control, but also um, animal waste, uh, still something that's being wrestled over. And then of course there's, you know, the climate, uh, climate change, uh, what we're gonna do about that. 
so I think I think to the extent that our public officials can can do a better job of looking more for solutions than issues. I think that's a big problem. You know, it, it's great to be able to run and say the other person didn't do this, you know, and, and kind of keep that as an issue. Let's call, you know, there are plenty of things you can run on, folks. <laughs> you know, let's start running on solutions, saying, you know, we solved this problem, and we did it together, and now we're going to look at the next thing. I, I think people would react to that very positively. So we'll see. I'm hopeful, cautiously hopeful. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and we'll remain hopeful with you. Bob Bostock, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience and your wisdom uh, with us as we talk through uh, the environmental decade and, and President Nixon's legacy. Uh, I just want to take a brief moment as folks uh, uh, are still here with us to lay out a few upcoming events. Uh, next, this coming Tuesday, April 26th, we're having our first in-person event. Uh, we are honoring, uh, marking the bicentennial of Ulysses S. Grant, as well as the centennial of the Grant Memorial right here along the uh, Capitol Reflecting Pool in Washington, D.C. Uh, information about this event and all of our upcoming programs is on our website. Uh, on May 12th, we're going to be continuing our constitutional amendment series with Floyd Abrams, the, one of the most important First Amendment attorneys of our time, talking about the freedom of the press. Uh, and then I also want to bring to everyone's attention another in-person uh, and virtually accessible event, uh, a symposium marking the centennial of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, 1922 was a big year for memorials here in Washington, D.C. So with these programs coming up, I also like to make the quick reminder, as, as Jane likes to say, it's our, it's our public radio moment, uh, that the U.S. Capitol Historical Society is not government funded. We exist on the uh, support uh, and, and contributions of our members uh, and people who uh, appreciate the, the work of public history. And so uh, to those of you who are members and, and donors, we're very grateful. To those of you who aren't, we invite you to come join us anytime. Uh, and with that, I will once again just say, Bob, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and we look forward to talking with you again soon. Well, thank you, Sam. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with the uh, folks who watch this webinar and also salute the work that the Capitol Historical Society does. I, I think of the Capitol having worked on the Hill as kind of secular sacred ground and uh, the work that you are doing uh, to inform people not only about the history of the building, but about uh, current topics as well is just so important. And I really uh, appreciate it and applaud you for doing it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Bob. All right, everyone be well and have a great weekend. Thank you.